All right, well, we've reached the end of our series on ethnography, and I'd just like to review what we've learned. So first of all, ethnography is like a fusion of in-depth interviewing and observational research, but it has a different aim and a different perspective. We're using similar techniques, but we have a different purpose behind them. And really, again, the goal of ethnography is to find the hidden obvious in what uh, individuals have to teach us. So ethnography is about finding the hidden obvious. And when I say the hidden obvious, what I'm really referring to are things that once you know them make a lot of sense, but before you know them um, are just completely uh, disguised and hard to find. So the power of ethnography is in being able to reveal that, but it is difficult and it takes a lot of, ex a lot, a lot of time and a lot of trouble. Ethnography is extremely rooted in individual experience, and that limits it as a, a sole primary method. So don't just use ethnography to conduct uh, qualitative research, is, is my recommendation. Use it as an augmentation tool to other research that you're doing. If you're doing observation, or you're doing in-depth interviewing, or you're doing focus group, add in a couple of um, ethnographic interviews. Um, preferably some, some detailed ones, and you will benefit from it in the long run. Now, granted, getting a client to pay for that is difficult in a marketing research context, but if you can get them to, to do it, they will benefit. They'll be glad that they did it. Four, good ethnography makes use of environment and cohorts, not just a research subject. So make sure that you're paying attention to more than just what that subject is doing and saying. Make sure you're also paying attention to where they are, how they respond to the environment around them, how they respond to the people around them, what the people around them have to say. All of those things are really um, great and important part of, of ethnographic research. The allure of ethnography is storytelling, but remember that your own bias will heavily impact the stories that you tell. So one thing that I'm, I'll probably talk a little bit more about in our workshop, um, but which I think is, is important is Ethnography does not have to be conducted by a researcher, okay? It can be conducted by your client. Believe it or not, that's actually not always a bad idea, especially if they're in a service business or if they're in a business where they really need to understand the customer experience. Encouraging them to do a, do a ride-along with a customer or a salesperson or to really just get a sense of what it's like to go through their system is useful. But the problem that they're going to have is that they're going to filter everything through their experience. They're going to filter everything through what they already know going in and how they interpret what they went through. And they might not reach the same conclusion that um, someone like yourself as a researcher might. So always be mindful of how that bias is going to impact the stories that you're going to tell. Um, if you have a client that goes through an ethnographic process, they're going to, to bias everything towards their preconceptions. You as a researcher are going to bias everything towards your preconceptions, and your preconceptions may or may not be right. Um, they may or not be wrong either, but they might just be wrong for that particular study. So be very, very careful that you're not cherry picking out stories that suit your way of thinking, but which are not really representative of what you heard. It's easy to do. It's extremely easy to do. It is a caution that I, I cannot uh, offer highly enough in this lecture series that you have to be really careful about. However, um, if you're guarded against it, you will do a better job of not falling victim to it. Okay, so as I was talking about at the beginning of our lecture series, I grew up on a military base, but eventually, when I turned 10, we moved off base. We actually moved to the Metro East here in, in Illinois. Um, and because the military base that we moved to didn't have any housing available for like, it's been like two years, we wound up moving into a suburban neighborhood uh, um, and, and much more civilian style of life. And in fact, a couple of years later, my dad had the opportunity to get out of the Air Force and we actually became civilians. We were no longer in the military. We still lived in a community where there were a lot of military people, but there were also a lot of people who were not military. And for me, this was a big adjustment. First of all, it was a big adjustment seeing all these houses that were not like each other. Uh, the neighborhood that we moved into had some older houses that were built in the 50s and 60s, and then some newer houses that either had just been built or were being built. And in our little section of the neighborhood, um, our, we had a two-story house. And my initial inclination was to feel more closely aligned with people that had a floor plan like ours because that 
seemed to me like they must have chosen something that that uh, about their house that made them more like us than the people that had the single story houses or that had floor plans that were really different from ours. And I realized pretty quickly that was a, a foolish way of looking at the world. Uh, the people that were moving into two story houses that looked looked like ours often were really different. They might have had kids that were different ages. They might have been old retired couples. They might have been people that were just getting started out in life. They might have just been people that had entirely different lifestyles. The type of house that they chose didn't tell me anything about them. Um, the identical housing that we had had living on base was just a fluke. It wasn't anything that was really representative of who these people were. I also had to learn that many of the people that I was going to get to know were going to have different experiences from me, and they were going to have different ways of seeing the world from me. Many of them were living in communities that they're uh, living in a community that their family had lived in for a while. You know, maybe their grandparents had moved there and raised their parents there, or maybe their family had lived a town over and had moved over. They had connections to the community that I didn't have. Um, a lot of the kids had known each other since kindergarten. Um, many of them had the same doctor their whole life, which is weird to me. I'd always had military doctors, so it's always different. Um, many of them had connections to um, people in the community through uh, uh, family or, or through uh, close uh, family relationships or through churches or things like that 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 I never knew or really understood um, until I got much older. But eventually, um, once my dad got out of the military and, and I was more settled in the civilian lifestyle, I found myself kind of adopting those ways and kind of thinking much more like the civilians that, that I was living around. I was never entirely like them. I always felt a little bit different because of my military kid upbringing. But I began to understand their way of seeing the world a little bit more, just being embedded in their culture becoming a part of their culture <clears throat> and beginning to shed some of my own beliefs and understandings. And ultimately, when you are a researcher, when you're conducting something like ethnography, that's ultimately what you're going to find is the more that you get embedded in and begin to understand a culture, the more that you feel like you have a part in it. Even though you're not technically a part of it, um, you begin to, to, to have the perspective where it, it starts to make sense intuitively in a way that it didn't before. It starts to lose its mystery and it starts to just make sense. And that is ultimately what I want to leave you with, is this thought that we as researchers can go into situations where things feel very strange or very foreign and we can be extremely interested in the minutia. Ultimately though, these things are going to lose their mystery to us. They're going to lose their value to us because we're going to begin to understand them. And when that happens, the best thing for us to do is to start looking for fresh new perspectives, to start thinking outside the box, to start trying to find a way to bring that mystery back to, to what we're looking at. And that might mean looking at a new cohort. It might mean looking at a new area. It might mean just writing down all of our preconceptions and being willing to shed them and try to look at things from a new point of view. Because ultimately the most damaging thing to any kind of ethnographic study that you can do is to get too familiar with the data that you're getting so that you're not amazed by things anymore. Ultimately, from my point of view, ethnography is about being interested. It's about being curious. It's about trying to learn about people that you don't understand. And if you can be good at that, you can be a good ethnographer. With all that said, our next series is going to be all about the most popular qualitative technique, and that is focus groups. And we're going to have a lot of fun talking about focus groups. So don't miss it. And also be sure to watch that lecture series with um, David Rich of the Research and Planning Group. Not only is it a great segue into our next lecture series, but David is just an outstanding qualitative researcher and you will learn a lot from him. Enjoy. <laughs>